Okay, good morning. Welcome to the Digital Projects Showcase. Uh, this presentation uh, is a look at recent public library digitization initiatives. Um, and we are going to hear this morning from nine different uh, presenters, all of whom have recently undertaken um, digitization projects of one variety or another. Um, we are going to kick off this morning with a presentation from Janet Boudet, um, who I will introduce in just a moment. But I just wanted to let folks know that you are welcome to type your questions into the chat box as they arise, but we will be uh, holding questions until the end of the nine presentations. Um, we do have a couple of presenters who have chosen to pre-record their sessions because they were unable to attend in person, but we will give you um, access to all of their um, email addresses so you can certainly follow up or I can follow up on your behalf. So I'm going to um, switch over to Janet's slides. So bear with me for one moment. And I'm so sorry, I said Janet and I meant Melody. I was looking at Janet's little icon on the screen <laughs> who popped up above, but we are gonna hear from Melody this morning, Melody Jenkins. She is the interim director and the adult services librarian at the Moultrie Colquitt County Library System. And her presentation is called Postcards for Dummies or How We Did It. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Melody now. Thank you, Angela. Good morning from sunny and hot South Georgia. I hope no one is offended by the title. The dummies that I refer to are myself and the other adult services librarian here in, uh, at the Moultrie Library because we knew nothing about postcards and very little about in-depth cataloging. But we started a project um, during a renovation of the library when we uncovered four collections of cards. And then because of COVID, we had some time hands when we weren't seeing patrons coming in the front door. So we started in um, uh, April of 2020. Uh, you can advance to the next slide. Ahead. We started in April 2020 and we finished in May of 2020. So it is not a project for the faint of heart. Um, you have to have stamina to do this. Slide. We entered everything in Google, Google Docs, and we were not really familiar with that too terribly much, but we managed. Uh, it looks rather daunting. This is a slide of the metadata form, and there are 19 columns. Now, only five of those columns are really time consuming. Many of them are standard things like title, the date of the postcard, um, the subject and the Description take a lot longer to do. Slide. When we scanned, we used a very nice machine, the Epson Perfection V39 Color Photo Scanner, less than $100 on Amazon.com, and it does a beautiful job. You have to have at least 400 DPI compression, TIFF format, and you get to name your own files. And this example that I have is a standard for the name Harris. That was the original owner of the catalog collection of each of the different collections, but then we just numbered them consecutively. I know I shouldn't have to say this, but I will back up, back up, back up, as you do with anything on the computer. Uh, we had our original on the laptop. We backed up on an external hard drive. We put the photos in Dropbox, and then we transferred them to Angela in Google Photos. So we had lots of backups. Slide. You have to decide what you're going to scan. And these are a few of our postcards. You can see there are some that are of historical value, either national or international, that shows history in an area. Many of the scenes and the buildings uh, are no longer in existence in our collection. 
Some of the title, some of the postcards were unique. We have a huge Scottish collection, genealogy collection here in our library. We had a whole collection of Scottish postcards. Some might be humorous, as you can see in the one that was um, up here in the top left-hand corner, which was very timely because we were in the midst of COVID and this lady is asking about when she's going to get her inoculation, her vaccination and where. So you have to decide exactly what you're going to scan into your collection. Slide. There are a few tips and tricks. This is our cheat sheet. It looks rather messy, but these were the sites that we use quite frequently when we were referring to our postcards. And we thought about putting it in a nice format, but we got so used to referring to this and exactly where things were on the page, we just left our scribbles. But it always helps to have a nice cheat sheet so you can easily refer to the sources you're going to be using a lot. Slide. If you want your um, to appear on the DLG's mapping tool, which is very good because then if a person sees this online, um, they want to visit this place, they can have the latitude and longitude so they can put it in their own GPS and go and visit. Um, it's very easy. It goes in the coverage uh, spatial field. And you have your standard headings of, for instance, United States, comma, Georgia, comma, Coquit County, comma, Moultrie. But then you have your latitude and longitude by going to Google Maps and just dropping a pin, and it will give you those. If you can't find an exact location, we just city center for some of our locations. Slide. Dating cards can be very interesting. You can look at the type of card, whether it's linen textured, whether it has borders, white borders around it, whether it is, has a divided back. Those were all printed in different time periods. Uh, if it has postage affixed on the back, you can look at the postage and uh, you can see how much postage it took. And there are lots of charts that you can find for what postage was used at what time period. A postmark is really great because then you have an exact date and a lot of times a time. You can find the publisher uh, and on the publisher, if you go into some of the websites that I'm going to talk about in just a moment, they actually tell you when these publishers were printing postcards. The content of the picture will tell you the size of the card. Um, if, ha if they have a zip code, uh, in the uh, address on the back of the card. Um, you can tell because zip codes didn't begin until July 1963, so that gives you a starting point. Area code sounds kind of funny because you're wondering about phone numbers, but in the printed information on the back of the card, if it's a hotel, for instance, and they use this as an advertisement, they would have their phone number. So the three-digit area codes didn't begin until 1951, so that gives you a little tip. Slide. In your description, which is the hardest one column to fill in on this metadata sheet, um, in a standard format. Uh, we started with the item type, which was postcard, and then a description, whether it was color, black and white, divided by the size, then the title, which can usually be found on the printed on the front of the postcard, description of the content. And then if there's any text on reverse, that is an exact quote of the text that's on the reverse. If it has a postmark, if it has postage affixed and what type of stamp it was, and if it is just has postage required. And then most cards have a number printed on them. Uh, this one is a very detailed description, one of our longer ones. And we put a note because the oilette process was a different process. And we thought it was very interesting that Raphael Tuck was the art publishers to Her Majesty the Queen and future sovereigns continued this warrant or appointment. So we thought that was interesting to know. The description that we had got detailed for two reasons. One is because we had to look up a lot of information about the when we were trying to put our subject headings in because we weren't familiar with a lot of these things. So while we were looking them up, we thought, why waste that research? Being a good librarian, we wanted to share it. And we also figured that when people were 
accessing these cards, it would be very helpful to researchers to already have some of their research done and right there on the page. Slide. This is one of our shorter descriptions. And you can see we didn't go into a great deal of uh, information at the bottom. Slide. There are a lot of websites and the first three that are on here are very useful. The Metro Postcards gives an illustrated history of postcards. It has a glossary of terms. It has uh, information about the different printing techniques, information on publishers and printers, and it also has the mailing rates in various areas. So you can find um, the publishers here and maybe the years that they were publishing cards to help you with your dating. The next two sites uh, have logos and initials for publishers because a lot of times on the postcards, the publisher didn't put their complete information, they just had a logo. Um, you will get familiar with them during the time that you're working on the cataloging, but at the beginning, it's very nice to have this uh, chart. And the, uh, the logos and the initials are not only for the United States postcards, but for international postcards also. Slide. The next most important site is your Library of Congress subject headings. Um, cataloging was my least favorite subject when I was in library school, probably because I had to take it at 8 a.m. Um, during winter quarter on uh, Friday morning, and it was usually snowing in Lexington, Kentucky, so that's why I didn't like it. So I had to refresh a lot of my memory on doing the cataloging and the Library of, Su of Congress subject headings websites was was very good and also the right statements because that's something you have to look at is copyright and uh, who holds the copyright slide once we finished with our project we had to figure out how we were going to display them on the left you see the notebooks that they came in which were just photograph albums when we uncovered the collection on the right is our nice format at the very end uh, we used archival notebooks, display pages, and individual envelopes for each of the postcards so that if we had to handle them or anyone had to handle them in the future, they would be protected. We also printed out the description and put it next to the postcard so that if someone was just looking at this manually um, and not have the access to online information, they would have the information there too. Um, all of our uh, in our, our archival information and supplies came from a company called printfile.com and they're very reasonably priced. Slide. We thoroughly enjoyed our project. Uh, we would be welcome to have anyone come and talk with us or interact with us online so we can tell you what we did and how we did it and help you along a little bit. And we hope that the information that's contained in this is going to be helpful to many, many researchers in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melody. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, pass it over to Jeff Fisher. Um, Jeff is the Material Services Manager at the Forsyth County Public Library and he'll be talking about a recent newspaper digitization project. Take it away, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to endeavor to share my screen. And you should at this point be able to see a slideshow. So my name is Jeff Fisher. I'm the Materials Services Manager for Forsyth County Public Library. We are an outer layer suburb of Atlanta. We serve approximately 250,000 patrons. We have four library locations, a bookmobile, and then we are also in the planning stages for a fifth library location. Uh, I am the material services manager, which is a very fancy way of saying I oversee the selection, cataloging, purchasing, and processing of books. So we are in the midst of a rather large and, and, and lengthy digitization project of the Forsyth County News. The Forsyth County News is our local newspaper of record for Forsyth County, as well as the city of Cumming, which is the only municipality within Forsyth County. Several years ago, we received permission from the publisher of the Forsyth County News to digitize 
issues from 1916 through the beginning of 2013. And this was approximately 165,000 pages of digitization. The reason we went up to the beginning of 2013 is that Digital Library of Georgia, the University of Georgia had those issues on microfilm. And I will speak a little bit more to going beyond that here in just a moment. But, but again, that was our initial range was 1916 through the beginning of 2013. As we have gotten closer to the completion of that initial range of digitization, our administration requested that I contact the publisher to see if they would give us permission to further digitize. And they did, and they very generously are going to allow us to go from the beginning of 2013 through the last issue of 2019. And what I will say to that is we did not have the, excuse me, uh, the University of Georgia did not have microfilm in their possession that covered 2013 through 2019, but we did. So that microfilm has actually been sent from the library and has been with uh, DLG for, I guess, a couple months now. And they are in the process of looking through that, making sure that they can digitize that, as well as giving us an estimated page count and a cost for doing that as well. So funding, which is obviously a very important consideration when you're discussing a project of this scale. So initially under my predecessor several years ago when this project began, we were able to procure a Georgia home place or an archival services and digital initiatives grant through the Digital Library of Georgia. So that funded the initial round of digitization. Since then, we have been using a combination of our regular library materials budget, as well as using some library fund balance. And again, we evaluate how and what we, of those two sources, we evaluate how and, and how much from each one we want to use as we get to each respective fiscal year. The timeline for the digitization of the Forsyth County News has so far covered three fiscal years. And for us, I think for most of you listening today, uh, our fiscal year ends on June 30th and begins on July 30, or July 1st. So we're about to enter fiscal year 2022, but it's gone from fiscal year 2019, 2020, and 2021. So we've done digitization in those three segments. We're about to enter a fourth fiscal year of digitization. And then depending on everything that happens with the new permissions we got from the publisher and the microfilm we've sent DLG, we anticipate that this will extend into a fifth fiscal year in FY2023. Uh, but again, as, as we've achieved these, these goals with each fiscal year, we've been very excited and our staff has been excited as well as our patrons. And that concludes the presentation from my end of things, uh, I'll be here for questions and answers uh, at the end of this, as well as uh, if you wanna reach out and contact me as well. And I'm having a little bit of trouble. Okay, I'm stopping the share right there. And I think we're all good. So thank you for your time. And, and again, please feel free to reach out with me with any questions. Thanks so much, Jeff. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Elizabeth Goggin. Um, Elizabeth served as uh, the 2020 GPLS and Roddenberry Memorial Library intern, digitization intern. Um, and she will be presenting on the project she worked on called They Endure, <clears throat> excuse me, digitizing black oral histories in Cairo, Georgia. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen in um, in presenter mode. Oh, now we're in presentation mode, great. All right, awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Goggin. Um, as Ms. Stanley already stated, I was the GPLS digitization internship uh, intern last summer. Um, I'm also a recent graduate of the University of Georgia uh, with a bachelor's in history. Um, and so my journey with oral history started my junior year of college. 
where I worked at the Richard B. Russell uh, Special Collections Library as an archival intern uh, with the oral history department, uh, which is why I was so drawn to this very compelling project that I'm so excited to present to y'all today. Um, it really is an incredible collection of work. Um, so my agenda for the project is I'm going to start off with a little uh, overview of the project and a short introduction, and then I'm going to get into the importance of these stories that are within the oral history project, and then I'm going to talk about accessibility, uh, which is something that I have become very passionate about when discussing uh, archives and libraries. Uh, so the project was recorded from 1981 to 1982 in Grady County in the city of Cairo, Georgia. It's right along the Georgia-Florida line, really close to Tallahassee. Um, and so the project interviewers were Dr. Robert Hall um, and Mr. Frank Roebuck. And Frank Roebuck was a native of Cairo, Georgia. And Dr. Robert Hall was a professor and also um, a historian. Um, and one of the most incredible things about this oral history projects is the breadth of the interviewees. There really is um, an incredible expanse of interviewees ranging from people, um, women such as homemakers and midwives, um, as uh, sharecroppers and working as domestic servants. There really is just this breadth of people that are often left out of the historical narrative that are found within this project. And it covers an incredible expanse of subjects, uh, including rural schools, community churches, um, African-American cemeteries in Cairo, Georgia, um, and tobacco agriculture. I personally learned so much about shade tobacco that I'm pretty sure I could do it like right now. I could like go out to my porch and make shade tobacco. Um, and there were actually 78 oral history interviews um, and 49 photographic slides. Uh, most of the slides are uh, pictures of community churches um, and important buildings in Cairo, uh, whereas the 78 oral history interviews, um, they're often 45 minute long, and it's long. Um, I think the longest was 48, um, and they were all recorded on cassette tapes, so they have a very finite <laughs> limit um, as to how long they can record. Um, and so the photograph uh, that I have to the right is of really the important people on this project who made this project happen. Um, it's head librarian, Wesley Connell. Um, it's both of the uh, interviewers, Robert Hall um, and uh, Mr. Frank Roebuck as well. Um, and so some project highlights from the oral history collection uh, was the number of interviews um, and photographic slide preservation. When we originally started the project, we thought there were only 40-ish uh, oral history interviews, but as the project went on, I discovered that there were backs to all of the cassette tapes. Um, and so there were actually 78 interviews, um, which extended my summer internship into the fall of 2020, which was such an, a, a wonderful to discovery that we had almost double the amount of material that we thought we did. Um, and one of my personal favorite parts of this project is the diverse storytelling. Um, especially the stories of Black women in Cairo, um, how they survived motherhood and midwifery, um, homemaking. Some of them were entrepreneurs owning their own businesses. Um, and their, their stories are really, really valuable um, and very powerful. It's a very intimate thing to hear someone's voice in this way and to hear their story. Um, and the way this project reconnected family histories and community memory. Uh, when doing some research again for this presentation, I found like a local news interview um, about the project. And it was so incredible to see uh, people listening to their grandparents' voices and listening to the voices of their relatives that they hadn't heard in years. Um, and it was such a special thing to observe with this project was how it reconnected uh, the memory of the community with people who have been gone for many years. Um, during one of my last classes at UGA, I read uh, Silencing the, by the Past by Michael Roth Trillio. Uh, and in the book, he talks about silences in the historical narrative uh, and creating equitable archives. And I think this project is really a model for how we can create equitable archives in the state of Georgia. 
um, and doing that through showcasing projects like these and providing these projects um, with the accessibility and the funding uh, to make them open to the public. Uh, I was talking to one of my research mentors about this project and she said that even if the resource, the resource does not matter if there is no access, um, which is one of the incredible things about this project is that it is so accessible. Um, not only is it available on SoundCloud, it's also available on the Digital Library of Georgia, and it also has um, 78 ohm re ohms records, um, the oral history metadata synchronizer for anyone who wants to conduct research on this project. It's really widely available. Um, and how this project featured community engagement and local history. And so how the interviewers found interviewees was just by simply asking, was simply asking, who do you think that we could talk to in this community that needs to have their voice and their story told? Um, and by going back into the community and really discovering who they need to be speaking to um, is such a valuable thing as well. Uh, so lastly, I would like to say uh, thank you to Ms. Uh, Angela Stanley and to Library Director uh, Janet Boudet for giving me the privilege of working on this project. It really was um, such a wonderful experience and I'm really grateful that I was able to help do this and help tell some of these really wonderful stories. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and we also have uh, Janet uh, on the call as well. So um, Elizabeth and Janet will be available to answer any questions um, you may have. Uh, I saw a nice robust conversation about the pronunciation of Cairo, Georgia uh, in the chat. So um, always a, a, a fun topic. Um, all right, we're gonna pass it over now to um, Pat Herndon. Uh, Pat is the Assistant State Librarian and Director of uh, GLASS and um, for the Georgia Public Library Service, and she will also be talking about an oral history project. So take it away, Pat. And like everyone else, I'm going to say I hope you can see my, my slides. Um, thank you for the introduction, Angela. Um, I have trouble, I talk a lot, so I'm going to have trouble keeping it to five minutes, but I work with Georgia Public Library Service, and again, I'm director of Georgia's Library for the Blind and Print Disabled. The Library for the Blind and Print Disabled serves about 10,000 Georgians who cannot read standard print due to disability, including blindness, low vision, the inability to hold a book and turn the pages, or reading disabilities such as dyslexia. This includes a population, just like Elizabeth said, who are often disenfranchised from large parts of society, including ones of keeping their history. Libraries work to provide equity of access and develop opportunities for people to fully participate in their communities. The Glass Oral History Project was created with this spirit in mind. And I forgot to advance my own slide, there you go. So here are the goals of our project. We wanted to create a repository of personal histories of people with disabilities. We wanted these, this repository to be easy to access and accessible for people with disabilities. And we really wanted to educate the public through the voices of those within the community of persons with disabilities. And it doesn't hurt to help create awareness of our program. But of course we needed partners to make this happen. First, we had to, well, let me begin. Stephanie Irvin, who worked as a glass outreach specialist, originated this project in Georgia after hearing about a similar project at the Andrew High School Braille and Talking Book Library in New York Public Library had completed. Gave those, the people there that use that library an opportunity to tell their stories. The model that they used was very much in the style of StoryCorps. An interviewer would sit down and ask just enough questions to get the subject engaged in talking or telling their story. So here's what Stephanie Irvin made happen. First, she had to gather equipment, select subjects to be interviewed, solicit help from partners, identify a hosting agent to host her content, acquire professional transcripts, check all of this for accessibility and publicize. 
Our partners included glass outreach specialists across the state, including those in Southwest Georgia, Athens, and Augusta. They helped us collect the interviews. Stephanie had prepared an interviewer's handbook to guide the people who would be interviewing the subjects. Her handbook was very comprehensive, inviting the interviewers to review other collections of audio archives before they began. She shared tips on disability etiquette since she would and the interviewers would be working with people with disabilities. She shared tips on minimizing noise and distractions during the interview and tips for gently and with sensitivity eliciting more from an interviewee's story. Glass, under Stephanie's guidance, acquired recording equipment, which was pretty basic. She provided interviewers with an audio recorder, a camera, and the necessary release forms to allow us to have permission to use the interviewee's image and voice. She also had a data collection sheet, which I guess is what we call the metadata form that would accompany the interview files to ensure that everything would be accurately described in the virtual record. She solicited the first group of interviewees herself and she had contacts from her work in outreach and her knowledge of the community that Glass was currently serving. Stephanie worked first with Angela Stanley, Director of Archival Services and Digital Initiatives to get in contact with staff at the Russell Library at UGA. This group agreed to host our audio content, our transcripts, and provide the project description, cataloging, and a finding tool. They provided some key advice on what was needed to describe the files and make them accessible via search functions. Stephanie also contracted with AMAC, now called the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation, to create transcripts for the interviews. CIDI offers this service for a fee and works to support access to accessible media for all students in Georgia. Their work is impeccable and not even in the same ballpark as the digital transcription that many of us see when we're on Zoom and things like that. Glass did pay for this fee, but it was much less expensive than we had originally anticipated when we created our modest budget for the project. We had budgeted $5,000. We spent about $830 for the transcriptions. So money well spent. Stephanie was meticulous in assuring that the data stored in the Our Stories, Our Lives digital archive was accessible. This means that she had to assure that all images had to be tagged with all text and that the transcripts would be available at the same time that the audio files were uploaded. And of course, the last step was to publicize. Stephanie worked with Georgia Public Library Services Communications Department. They issued a press release and digital outreach to key constituents. The program was also publicized in the GLASS newsletter and on the GLASS website. Here's one of our interviewees, Mr. Stuart Levinson. And as Stephanie said, they shared, he shared his experience with us, whether it was a life story or a period of time, it was significant to the person telling the story. And we did hear a variety of beautiful stories, and I invite you all to listen to them as well. Uh, I had made this slide with our link to the stories, and guess what? Last night, and yes, last night, the URL changed. So the new URL, take the one that you see in the slide if you want to visit this and type GLS before Georgia Libraries. And because guess what, guys, we got a name change today. Um, this is what the collection looks like on the University Library Special Collections Libraries page at UGA Library. Just caught a screenshot so that you can see. And we do invite you to connect with us. And I further invite you to listen to these stories. They're interesting. They're compelling, and I think you'll learn something about the lives of people with disabilities that you may have never considered. I am acquainted with some of the people that told these stories, and my eyes were open. That's all I can say. So I invite you to visit this, and if you have any questions about our project, just let me know. Thank you. That was wonderful, Pat. Thank you so much for sharing all right, I am going to attempt to share my screen. Um, we are gonna move into the portion of the presentation 
um, where we will be listening to some pre-recorded um, uh, lightning talks. The first of which uh, is brought to us from the Live Oak Public Libraries. Um, Bell Reynoso, Linda Bridges, Jamie Whiting, and Marie w Russell are on the call today and will be available to answer questions. Um, but we're going to listen to their pre-recorded their pre-recorded uh, uh, talk. So I'm going to make this large. And all right, I'm going to hit play. Welcome to today's presentation, Voices of the Past, How Digitization of Local Documents Impacts the Community and the Preservation of History for African American History Leading Up to the Civil Rights Movement. This is going to be a short presentation on why we decided to digitize these documents in particular and the basics on how we went about doing that. Here is the contact information for all of us who were involved in the project if you have any questions after today. The slides will be available later on. Our choice for this digitization project was the Savannah Tribune. Now, why did we pick this newspaper? Primarily for its historic significance. As one of the longest running historical newspapers of the South, it is a lens with which we can peer into the lives of its readership. We could learn about the events they viewed as important and how such events affect their community. Without this resource, these thoughts, stories, and voices would be lost. Our digitization project focused on the period between 1943 to 1960, an incredibly important period of time for the African American community, spanning from the end of World War II through to the early civil rights movement. We chose these years, not just for their further historical significance, but because they were missing from any easily and publicly accessible online resources. Making these accessible online furthers the goal of providing accurate information to researchers and to the public. In order to secure our grant for this project, we did not just have to outline the many benefits of digitization. We also had to show that there would be no barriers. As such, we have to talk about the dreaded legalities. Specifically, we have to investigate the copyrights these newspapers could be attached to. If there is a copyright attached, you cannot digitize and reproduce the material without permission of the owner of the copyright. At any rate, a good place to start would be, to start your research would be Cornell University's public domain chart, which we have a link for at the end of the presentation. Once you have done your research and submitted your grant proposal, the only thing to do is to wait. If you've been awarded the grant, fantastic. You can send your material off to be digitized with whomever you are partnering with. Just be aware that this can take some time and delays can occur. These are the resources that were available. Again, the slides will be available after the presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask or email any of us further down the line. Again, all of our contact information is available earlier on in the slides. Thank you and have a great day. Okay, so that was our uh, presentation from the Live Oak Public Libraries on their newspaper digitization project. And now I am going to attempt to not confuse myself and share our next video, which is brought to us by the athens Clark County Library. Um, this uh, presentation is, is interesting because it's still in production um, and uh, is brought to us by Ashley Schell, the Archives and Special Collections Coordinator, and uh, Imani Carter, who is the um, Summer Digitization uh, Heritage Room Web Archive intern. So I'm going to embiggen this and let them take it away. Hi, I'm Ashley Scholl, Archives and Special Collections Coordinator at the athens Clark County Library. My presenting partner today is Amani Carter, our web archival intern. We are happy to bring you this quick session on the challenges and successes of web archiving a local response to COVID-19. 
we were lucky enough in October of 2017 to receive a grant through Archive It in order to start a locally based web archive here at the Athens Park County Library. Through that grant, we've received training materials as well as um, a data package in order to continue to archive the web content of Athens Park County and the community. So when COVID-19 happened, obviously our first response sitting at home that first week was like, oh, let's start grabbing content related to COVID in our community's response. So this collection is a result of that. Here are some challenges that we faced, however. We had a hard time um, kind of determining what seeds or URLs, websites that we were going to include in the collection. Do we want to grab newspaper articles? Um, Facebook is particularly challenging to collect content from using Archivit. Um, even some other social media sites, because of the dynamic iterations of them and the way that they change coding consistently and regularly regarding privacy. Um, so social media feeds you know, are something that we kind of had discussions about, about which type of content from them were we going to capture, were we going to not capture them. So another one of those challenges was making sure that we accurately linked Google Docs with information about resources like food distribution sites, um, grant opportunities, information about moratoriums on rent and eviction. Um, and then those subsequent websites kind of resulted from those Google Docs. And so we were trying to link that through our metadata um, in order to show that evolution from a community collected Google Doc in order to a thriving kind of nonprofit organization in the matter of months. Lastly, scrolling through all of this content on a regular basis when we were each individually sitting at home kind of took a toll, much like it did on the rest of the world. But here we were not only experiencing in our personal lives, but also our professional lives. We each kind of collectively experienced that, you know, talking to each other about that experience as a team. And then we each individually kind of came up with some coping mechanisms to get through that challenge. Amani will now present about some of our successes. Hello, I am Amani Carter. I am fortunate to work as the intern for the Athens Park County Library's uh, Heritage Room because the library received this summer's GPLS digital internship, which allows for 20 hours of training and working of an intern to complete a digital project. The digital project I have been tasked to work on is the Athens Area COVID-19 Response Web Archive. Another success is that even a year later, we are still able to collect and grab content that was initially missed. We are also in the process of working with Archivit to ensure that these resources are accurately captured, namely YouTube content and social media sites such as Twitter and Instagram for future researchers. Thank you so much, Imani. Um, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. This collection is still a work in progress. Clearly, we have Amani, our G GPLS intern, working on this project. Um, we hope to grab content relating to the vaccine rollouts within the community, as well as contact site owners in order to gain permission to include the content within the archive. Amani is working on metadata for this collection so that it will be really robust and searchable and um, able to be used by researchers in the future. And as many of us know, the true value of the collection or of any archival collection, especially when it's modern, it's captured in this kind of format, will not really be known for years. But we hope this effort to archive our community's response is beneficial in the future and impactful. So thank you very much, Amani, as well. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, so that was our presentation from the athens Clark County Library. Uh, we're now going to hear from Tina Monaco at the Augusta Richmond County Library for our third and final um, oral history project presentation today. 
Um, and Tina Monaco is uh, the Georgia Room historian at the uh, Augusta Richmond County Library. And here we go. Hi, everyone. I'd like to thank Angela Stanley and GPLS for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this presentation and to talk about one of the Augusta Richmond County Public Library System's digital collections. I've chosen the Augusta Chinese American Oral History Project that was undertaken between 2011 and 2012. First, I'd like to give a little background on Chinese immigrants in Augusta, Georgia. In 1873, the Augusta Chronicle reported 200 Chinese laborers were brought to Augusta to widen and deepen the Augusta Canal. After the project's completion in 1875, most of those men drifted elsewhere, but a few did remain in Augusta, opening grocery stores. The 1880 census reported 10 Chinese living in Augusta out of 17 living in Georgia. By 1900, Augusta's Chinese population was 41. Because of the Chinese Exclusion Acts of 1882 and 1902, no Chinese families from those early years exist today in Augusta. In 1885, First Baptist of Augusta began a Chinese Sunday school to minister to the men living in Augusta. It was one of the oldest organized Chinese Sunday schools in the nation and still exists today. The men were motivated to attend as a means of learning and improving their English. The nucleus of the present day community of Chinese American families began around 1915 with the arrival of wives and families to Augusta. From that point, Augusta's Chinese community began to grow. In 1927, 59 local Chinese men signed a petition to charter the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association or the CCBA of Augusta. It is one of the Southeast oldest Asian organizations and the Augusta Chinese community is among the old the largest in the Southeast. One needs only to search city directories, official documents, and doctoral dissertations. What was missing, though, was an archive of personal histories of individuals and their memories of their parents and grandparents before and during the time they lived in Augusta. And this lack of personal histories was the impetus for the oral history project. So in July of 2011, the Georgia Humanities Council awarded the CCBA in partnership with the Augusta Public Library, a $2,000 grant to con conduct an oral history project to create and archive life experiences of the Augusta Chinese who grew up or had families in Augusta between 1927 to 1940. The CCBA Oral History Committee identified 27 elders, so folks who are 70 years or older who were in Augusta during that time period and through one-on-one -on -one interviews and interactions, family tree and personal history information was documented. At the completion of the project in 2012, the oral interviews in DVD format were given to the Augusta Public Library to be housed in the Georgia Heritage Room collection. The CCBA undertook the project as a gift to CCBA families, the Augusta community at large, for future generations. But when I entered the picture as manager of the Georgia Heritage Room in 2014, I realized that oral histories were being underutilized and were just sitting on the shelf. No one really knew they were here except the CCBA and library staff. However, I was receiving phone calls and emails from out of state researchers and scholars who knew about the oral histories and wanted access. Unfortunately, since the oral histories weren't digitized, access uh, required a visit to the Augusta Public Library and specifically to the Georgia Heritage Room. So in June of 2018, I applied through the Digital Library of Georgia's subgranting program for funding to make the oral histories available in the DLG portal. Subgrants are offered for small digitization projects of original archival content at a cost of under $5,000. Uh, $5, including audiovisual materials. Uh, so I felt the oral histories were the perfect candidate for that. Ultimately, the cost for premium metadata services, storage and hosting was under uh, $1,500. And because the process was so streamlined on DLG's end, the entire project was completed in four months. Uh, lastly, every month the Augusta Public Library receives an analytics report from the Digital Library of Georgia breaking down how our digital collections are performing. 
And as you can see, the Augusta Chinese American Oral Histories are one of our top viewed collections. So certainly having the oral histories made available through the DLG portal has increased accessibility in a way that was being lost with them just sitting on the shelves. So that concludes my portion of this presentation. Thank you. Okay, so that was Tina Monaco with the Augusta Richmond County Public Library. Um, Tina is unfortunately unable to join us uh, for the Q&A today, but is available by email and is more than happy to answer any questions folks may have about um, this wonderful project. All right. Oh, baby. <laughs> Our uh, next to last presentation is from Kim Cannon. Um, Kim is the Program and Outreach Coordinator for the Northeast Georgia Regional Library System. Look inside Georgia's first maternity hospital through a digitized community scrapbook. Hi, my name is Kim Cannon. I'm the Program and Outreach Coordinator for Raven County Public Library, a branch of the Northeast Georgia Library System. This is my 15th year with the library, but my first time participating in a conference as a presenter. Over the years, Raven County Public Library has collected close to 100 scrapbooks from various clubs and organizations throughout the county. We have one fragile scrapbook dating back to 1927. The more fragile ones were hidden away out of fear they would be destroyed if someone tried to open them. One of these was the Maternity Home Scrapbook, which contains photos, handwritten notes, and a typed narrative detailing the history of the maternity hospital written by the nurse who started it. We had originally planned to scan the maternity home scrapbook in-house using our desktop scanner. A small scanner and a small staff hindered that project and put it on hold until Angela Stanley, Director of Archival Services and Digital Initiatives for Georgia Public Library Service, came to visit the library and view our collection. When Angela saw the maternity hospital scrapbook, she was especially interested due to its unique nature and there not being many primary sources available. Early 2020, we delivered the scrapbook to the Digital Library of Georgia office on the campus of the University of Georgia. Due to COVID restrictions, we waited patiently for the digital birth of our scrapbook. Spring 2021, the much anticipated arrival occurred and the scrapbook was available on the DLG website for all the world to see. Raven County has a strong history of being a small, close-knit community. Many years ago, there were little pocket communities scattered throughout the county. Until 1942, there was no designated maternal care available. If a woman went into labor, her choices were for someone to make the journey into town to fetch the doctor or for a neighbor or family member to deliver the baby at home. A nurse, Joe Kinman Brewer, worked diligently to bring quality care, education, and services to the women and babies of the small Northeast Georgia County, and the maternity hospital was open from 1942 until the general hospital absorbed OB patients in 1952. Because of the close-knit nature, there was a great pride in the maternity home. Families and community members felt ownership and a desire to support the project. The scrapbook contains newspaper clippings that list the donations made by the community. It was not uncommon for the maternity home to receive gifts of fresh produce or eggs or bed sheets or even one dollar at a time. The scrapbook also documents the spotlight on the county after word began to spread. Many visitors came to our area to tour the facility and learn how to replicate the program. Mrs. Brewer had developed classes for prenatal and newborn care, which was a much needed and welcomed addition to the public health department services and other states wanted to learn more. Raven County Public Library reached out to the Raven County Historical Society for additional information on the maternity hospital. Angela Stanley and I spoke with Mary Elizabeth Law, former director of the Historical Society and mother of two children born in the maternity home. Mrs. Law said, the maternity home was one of the very first in the state. It was sponsored by the health department and was a considerable opportunity historically and medically. It could not have happened without the support of the people and Ms. Kinman. We have an excellent working relationship with the Historical Society and plan to further collaborate on other projects in the future. I have learned through the process of having this scrapbook digitized that my mom was born in the maternity hospital. For me, the scrapbook holds a glimpse of what my grandmother experienced when she gave birth to my mom. Since she's no longer here to share this story, I still feel a connection to her through the pictures, articles, and personal notes included. In addition, there were 10 children in my father's family. Five were home births, four in the maternity hospital, including twins, and the last in the general hospital. 
As I look through the scrapbook, I'm confident my grandmother, as a young mother, was relieved once she had a place to go to deliver her babies in comfort and with support provided by an entire community. I also discovered my grandmother worked in the maternity hospital, a piece of connection I never knew. Raven County Public Library hopes to one day have more of our scrapbooks digitized. They hold memories and stories of the people who built this community. Part of the job of public libraries is to make information available. Thankfully, through the Digital Library of Georgia and Georgia Public Library Service, a valuable piece of history is now available to people all over the world, not just Raven County, Georgia. Thank you for participating today. I hope you will take a few minutes to explore our scrapbook online. Feel free to reach out if you would like more information. I would like to say thank you to Angela for inviting me to share our story, and thank you for recognizing the community importance of this scrapbook. Okay, and of course, yes, absolutely. I do encourage everyone to check out these digital collections online after the presentation today. Um, and uh, we can add those links to each individual project to, um, to the slide deck so they're uh, easier to get to. Our final presentation today comes to us from Jerry Mullis, who's the executive director of the Marshes of Glen Libraries in Brunswick, Georgia. My name is Jerry Lynn Mullis and I'm the Marshes of Glen Libraries Director. We're the public library system in Glen County, Georgia, and the Brunswick Library is home to a very beautiful and rare book that you see behind me. It's called the Codex. This large leather and metal bound manuscript was done on vellum and it is approximately four feet by two and a half feet when open. Estimated to have been created around 1560 to 1580, the Codex is a hand-lettered choral book likely created by a monk. It is believed to be Spanish in origin and was moved to an English monastery where it remained until the reign of King Henry VIII. When Henry VIII dissolved the Catholic Church in England, he distributed the property of the church to his supporters. The manuscript fell into private hands at this time. Francis L. Abreu of Sea Island, Georgia, acquired the manuscript in New York City. It was given to the Brunswick Library in 1975 by James L. Robeson of Brunswick, Georgia. Mr. Abreu and Mr. Robeson were partners in the architectural firm Abreu and Robeson, who designed the original Brunswick Library, built in 1975. Based on its sheer enormity in antiquity, the Codex is a popular item for public display. However, even with regularly scheduled preservation measures, the volume cannot withstand permanent public display. In 2019, the Brunswick Library underwent a major internal renovation. The closure was a perfect chance to digitize the Codex, as well as ensure it was properly stored away from the library during construction. Angela Stanley, the Georgia Home Place Director, graciously stepped in to coordinate a project of this magnitude and organized the Archives Department at the Atlanta Fulton Public Library's Auburn Ave Research Library on African American History and Culture to scan the codex at no charge, provided the work would be accomplished on an extended schedule as staff time permitted. The Auburn Ave Library hosts a renovated state-of-the-art digitization lab for its nearly 3,500 linear feet of rare and archival material. And their Zetual A0 scanner was up to the task of imaging the book and could accommodate its enormous size. After scanning was completed, Mrs. Stanley also arranged for the digitization to be available through the Digital Library of Georgia while not a replacement for occasional exhibits, making the volume available digitally through the statewide Digital Library of Georgia allows for permanent access to the codex while also providing for its physical preservation and security. Thanks to this project, we are excited to share this gem and treasure with all of Georgia and beyond. Okay, and that is all of our presentations. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to check in with our moderators to see if any questions came up in the chat. 
Uh, we just got a question in from uh, Benjamin Lamb. These are all incredible proje projects. I'm wondering if you can talk about how you determine the technical best practices for your projects. Um, so it sounds like this is a broad question not directed yeah. towards any one presenter. Yes, it does make sense. <laughs> um, does anybody want to take that first? Technical best practices. I can real quick. Um, yeah, so our project's unique because web archiving, like it's kind of it, only in the last like couple of years has really it had standards. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, it, it has, they've been formed. OCLC has metadata guidelines and like, uh, you know, suggestions that they've formed. Um, in regards to metadata, but not so much when it comes to like permissions and copyright. Um, so what you can and cannot include in a collection, you know, as we all know, like all website creators don't include uh, proper copyright information on the content that they share on their website. So um, we've taken it upon ourselves to ask permission from site owners in order to be included in the web archive. Um, we want to, you know, operate with an air of transparency as a public library. Um, but different uh, community, um, we're part of that community web cohort that Archivit has provided. I think they just added a a bunch more public libraries this last year. Um, they're adding a new cohort in August um, and uh, including institutions from Canada as well as the US. Um, so there's no longer the sole 27 of us who've been doing it since 2017. Um, but uh, as with that, we've always had conversations about how we are going about our best practices in regarding, you know, permission to some institutions are just grabbing content without asking permission. Some aren't or some are. Um, it just kind of depends on, uh, I think, the collection development policies that they have in place at an institution. So it's interesting. Um, and then Archivit is kind of taken over the technical side. It's it's really, it, they're the most prominent web collector of content out there. The most prominent, uh, I think over 90% of folks, of institutions involved in web archiving use Archivit um, because it's a nice plug and play kind of easy tool to use um, when you're doing it. So uh, they are kind of on the leading frontier there and serve the institution well, if we have a question about, hey, we want to grab this website, it doesn't seem like it's grabbing correctly because of some coding stuff that's going on. Um, they are on it very quickly and within like two to three days, we've got an answer or they'll tell us, hey, we're coming up with a script for that. Um, you know, we'll get back to you at a later date. So, um, you know, that's that's essentially what we've done um, with Archivit and having that cohort has been really helpful to as you know, as kind of like a new phase of web archiving in the public library domain. So, Thanks, Ashley. And because I want to be cognizant of time and I'm not sure if other folks need this meeting space, um, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, DLG's guidelines and best practices um, page, which um, many of the projects that have run through um, either GPLS or DLG have, have deferred to. Um, so a lot of the technical specs are also available um, through that link and then the various sublinks. So it's a great resource to poke around in and find what you need. Um, so, um, Unless there are any other questions, which I'm not seeing uh, in the chat. Oh, and Sheila is saying there's no rush. So, um, of course, if you need to jet and go eat some lunch, uh, by all means do so. Um, but uh, we'll stick around for just another minute or two to see if any other um, questions come in the chat. In the meantime, I'm going to share um, my screen one last time to make sure that everyone has access to um, our presenters' email addresses. Um, 
all of these slides and recordings will be available to you after the presentation is over. Um, and I believe those, uh, that will be through the SCED uh, platform. So this is um, contact information. Let's see if I can look at the chat while I'm doing this. Uh, we don't currently have any other questions outstanding. Okay. All right. Well, since it is 1205, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. But I want to say thank you to um, our nine presenters. And actually, it was more than nine presenters because we did have a, a couple of folks um, on a few of them there. So thank you all to everyone for sharing your projects. Um, I encourage all of our attendees to please um, go back and check them out online. Um, what I'll do is um, uh, edit this slide to include direct links to the projects affiliated with each presentation um, so that y'all can, can um, browse those more easily. Um, but thank you all for joining us today and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the conference. We did get one question.